right, so we're kicking off our second day here at the Jekyll Island Hard Asset Conference, and we have another fantastic keynote speaker who's decided to come down and join us, Mr. Frank Holmes. Frank is the head of U.S. Global Funds, as well as Hive Blockchain, and he's also the chairman of our very own Goldspot, which presented yesterday. Frank, thank you for coming down and being with us. Thank you. It's great. You know, years ago, uh, Doug Casey used to have a, a meetings like this, and it was called the Eris Society. And it was the idea, and he did it in, um, in Beaver Creek or Aspen, and it was where people can learn about, have new speakers and new thoughts and new ideas and, and then collaborate um, and see where new trends were going. So I think it's just great that uh, we would do it on Dr. Jekyll's Island, and uh, this is where the Federal Reserve started. I don't see any paved uh, roads of gold, but I, uh, I do see that uh, I went for a run this morning and it was spectacular. It's just so nice to see the sun coming up and the breeze. Uh, I'm so lucky and so blessed to be able to speak to all of you and share my thoughts and my experiences, and at the same time, for an old guy to be able to run uh, all along the, the beach here. I'm very lucky. I, uh, I'm going to try to give you, walk you through quickly, but I'm going to try to slow it down and then accelerate it and slow it down because they say that, especially for men, that sprinting is better than running long distances. Uh, they say that uh, it doesn't matter what you do with bursts, is because that's how our brains function for blood surging. They also say, and this really truly relates what the quants are doing today, energy. Energy is converted into a thought. A thought becomes a word. Write the sequence down. It's really interesting. Energy creates a thought. We produce about 60,000 thoughts a day. That thought becomes a word. Doesn't matter what uh, language you speak, it becomes a word. That word is transformed into a feeling or an emotion. That feeling and emotion now converts that energy again into a behavior or an action. And then it starts all over again. That's sort of the loop. But it's all energy. And it's all a transfer of energy. And it can impact us. So if we get, become anxious, it's because we're worried about the future. And so therefore you have some fears about the future. If you're worrying, actually it's about the past. And the whole thing of Zen and meditation is about being in the now. And, and so that is the, so this whole thing of energy and how digital is taking and transforming this formation of energy. So this next this video, I could watch this over and over because it was like an epiphany for me. Uh, in Japan, they say there's two ways to learn. There's a kinsho, which is you, you learn by pain along one axis. And the other one is they call the satori, is when you get that aha moment. And geniuses have more aha moments than learning by pain. The majority of society need, doesn't learn from pain. They just don't learn. They are, that, as Einstein, they keep repeating something over and over and expect a different outcome. Uh, they don't realize this. But people that truly learn, the majority of us learn from mistakes. And we go back and we recognize that. But the most important part is that orgasm of that, in your brain you go, aha, I figured that math formula out. Aha, I know what this relationship is. And that's what AI is doing in a faster way because it has to work a lot of what they call intuition. The process of how do you take probabilities and create more aha moments, a lot of that is showing up in this sort of AI. And I'm going to try to help you understand how it's doing it. The other part is I started off in speaking today regarding words. The significance of words, I never really appreciate it until I saw how it was being converted into economic outcomes. Now, I know my, up, my upbringing, my father is, a, is an Anglican priest, and I know all this stuff about to the best I can, nothing compared to him on spirituality and meditation and prayer and, and your thoughts and words, they have these feelings, but nothing to the point where this AI machine learning is taking sentiment of words 
And they're transforming that into an outcome. And they know that that outcome has what they call a gamma. That is, it has impact, but it's never long for accuracy. It may be long, for we play long cycles, they play short cycles. They play high frequency of knowledge and information and know that that knowledge is good for, in the capital markets, for X percent over Y period with a Z probability. And when you grasp that, you will now watch this video. I want you to laugh a lot, but I want you to recognize how much is being done in the world of gold on the application of AI to words. Words that you think, words that you speak, that words that create feelings, which create behavior, which is buy and sell and sometimes hold. T3 noticed something interesting about Twitter lately, particularly when this guy gets hold of it. Anytime a company mentions moving to Mexico or overseas or just doing something bad, he's on it. He tweets, the stock tanks. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Tweet, tank. Everyone's talking about how to make sense of all this. T3 thought the unpredictability of it created a real opportunity. Meet the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Trump and Dump is a bot powered by a complex algorithm that helps us short stocks ahead of the market. Here's how. Every time he tweets, the bot analyzes the tweet to see if a publicly traded company is mentioned. Then, the algorithm runs an instant sentiment analysis of the tweet in less than 20 milliseconds. It figures positive or negative. A negative tweet triggers the bot to short the stock. Like earlier this month, his Toyota tweet immediately tanked the stock, but the Trump and Dump bot was out ahead of the market. It shorted the second after his tweet. As the stock tanked, we closed our short, and we made a profit. Huge profit. Oh, and we donated our profits here. So now, when President Trump tweets, we save a puppy. It's the Trump and Dump automated trading platform. Twitter monitoring, sentiment analysis, complex algorithms, real-time stock trades. All fully automated. All in milliseconds. And all for a good cause. From your friends at T3. Now, this was a brilliant promotion by a quant trading platform, uh, and it went viral. But what it truly resonated is what I was seeing in the gold space, because I have gold funds, and, and I was noticing um, another sort of a real breakthrough is, is Greece. So when Greece stock market shut down for almost eight weeks, there was an ETF out there, and it was a Greek ETF. So how do you price it? There's no stock prices. So the quants came in and did all this correlation analysis against interest rates, and it was always these short-term, what are the highest probabilities for one day, recalibrated each day. And this $400 million ETF, you could not redeem or you could not put new money into it, but every day it traded 40 to $60 million worth of stock. And when the Greek market opened, that, those stocks were within 3% of the opening prices. So think of that. Put that in the context. How could they do something for six, eight weeks, but it's by recalibrating because they know that a gamma of one day has a high probability, a much higher. So that blew me away because it became its own organism. It had its own life. This basket, based on another basket that wasn't even trading, had a life. Think of it that way. And I know that's what's happened, as I'll talk later about Hive blockchain, that it has become a life on its own. It has become a proxy for those who want to trade cryptos, and it has a 94% correlation to the same percentage move of cryptos every day. If cryptos are up 7%, we're up 7%. You can trade 12 million shares because it became a derivative for all those gold investors that do not want to open an account at an exchange and hear about hacking and uh, all those issues, but they want to speculate on the crypto world and it's become their proxy. So what I saw from AI, what it was able to do for the Greek stock exchange, ETF, is happening over here. 
uh, something can become its own organism. It becomes its own DNA. And that is really important to recognize the contribution to AI. And then for yourselves, writing press releases. How many here are involved in writing press releases for their companies? So the narrative, and how many here are lawyers that have to edit those press releases? One. So when we get, we got one which, is, is, which would be more important for me to have more for us here, so you can understand that there are two types of lawyers. There's the lawyer that's totally risk averse, so they write a narrative that's always definitively negative. And there's another one that talks about, well, these are the risks, but here's the opportunity. And how they write those words are picked up in 20 milliseconds. I repeat that. The quant world reads and digests those words in 20 milliseconds. The Federal Reserve, three years ago, came out and made an announcement that, that there was two words in a 250-page document, two words that should not have been there that were in the previous one. Now, why did they come out and make such a change? Because the stock market was taking off from two words. And the quant funds were buying the stock market, and when they came out and said those two words were in there by air, the market sold off. Now, there is just impossible for any human to read 250 pages of Fed minutes and, and turn around and make an economic decision. So they go back and they'll look over all the past 20 Fed white papers. They'll turn around and look for sequences of words, the, the, the meaning of the word, the pattern of the word, uh, the sequence of the sentences, the sequence of the paragraphs, and then they'll turn around and say, what happened when you had that probability? What, what was the significance of that, that sort of um, pattern of data sets, those fact patterns, that's the upper word, fact patterns, what was the outcome? And that's what Goldspot's trying to do with data for gold mining. And so they're... The gold space is you know, way behind what has taken place in the stock market since 2009. The fastest way to get around the compliance and the regulatory burden of being a retail broker or even an institutional or a money manager, because it's so onerous, the, the paper process of making a decision, the quants have done it and written the code that gets around this process. They still have to do their AML, but they have software for that that does it all within a minute. So that's how things are evolving and changing. So it's so important and to recognize what we call the, this word called quantamentals. The better portfolio managers, the active guy that really understands this, is using these tools. They're using these tools to make better decisions. I can get a tool that goes in and looks at every website of consumer product companies and tell me what products are selling. So what's on sale and what's not, and a company may be saying, hey, we're really doing well. Go to, and you can do an analysis of their website and what's selling, and guess what? You don't have to visit all their stores to find out if they're doing well or not. It's showing up on their website. And if their website's not up, up to speed and, up, and it's not current, then you actually don't want to own the stock because that's where the fastest growth of retail consumers are. Or if you want to turn around and use satellites and look at parking lots and do comparisons each month of how many cars are in the parking lot and then compare it to last month on the Monday and compare it to last year on this Mon Tuesday, Monday, and they do, all of a sudden they can do what the card counts are. And now it's even getting better. They can tell the, the cost of the car. Uh, insurance business. USAA is the biggest military insurance company in the world. They're just up the street from me in San Antonio. We, if you go get insurance... And they're doing it by zip code analysis. So you may just be across the street, and the value of your real estate is less, and the number of cars that are, in that, in the, that are bought there have a lower valuation by $10,000. Therefore, the insurance across the street is cheaper. They will charge you more because you're in a more expensive area. Your premium is going to be higher. Uh, and they found this from all this quantitative analysis, and that's why it helps them manage their error ratio. So we're seeing the better, the better active managers, there's this growth, and I see most often, like I mentioned yesterday, just this denial by fund managers. I think there's three gold fund managers that are just recently gone uh, in Toronto, uh, and it's, they have an old way of looking at things. They will not apply these tools, uh, and some of these portfolio managers are not that 
not that uh, old. Um, one was more consumed with uh, as environmental concerns as a gold fund manager uh, and social programs than they were was the stock actually going the factors going to make the stock grow up, go up. Uh, it, it's a loss of what are the factors that are driving stocks? A, last, a lack of focus. So the next frontier investing was, you'll hear about it more and more, quantumentals. So quant forces have a lot to do with basic physics. And, if, and, and once again, I always try to come to the triangle of decision making where you get this binary model. You get A and B gives you C. X and Y, Z axis gives you Z. Z. Depends where you're from. Project or project. Canada or Texas. So when we look at this, this sort of quant forces, it's either gravity, and if you say that, well, I'm going to apply physics of gravity, then you're looking for mean reversion, and that's what Ray Dalio is very big in, in understanding super cycles, and within the super cycles, how, do, how does mean reversion take place? And then if, then if you want to identify yourself as a stock picker, I'm a value investor. So value investors are always really playing mean reversion, and they're playing the gravity, the force, electromagnetic forces of coming back to the mean, or if it's way above the mean to sell to take the profit down. But if you're <laughs> a growth stock picker, then you're looking for inertia, and you're looking for momentum, and you're looking for growth. Well, what is momentum? What is inertia? It's a simple physics, Newton's laws. Newton had basically three basic laws, and those now are written in quant forms and algorithms that are applied to quant trading and quant research. Another way of looking at it is deduction. So my buddy over here, Sherlock Holmes, my distant relative, it's all about deductive thinking. And so coming back to thinking, it's either deductive or inductive. And inductive thinking is your gut. How many here make decisions on their gut? None? Yeah, I would hope so. How many make decisions only from analysis? Not one. Oh, one. How many here make it with both? And that's, now how well do you do that? How well do you develop your X and Y axis of knowledge and information is going to give you a better outcome? So it's all about this inductive thinking, and the quant world really wasn't good at the inductive thinking. They weren't able to, today they do. So that's how it's evolved, and so what is inductive thinking? that gut feeling that you have towards something, uh, that intuition. So th it's a real systematic thought process. And for me, for simple math, if you run, in a, if you run a, tr a trial, if you're an accountant, you look for a zero trial balance. Everything has to come down. You have to balance exact numbers, left column, right column. They have to come to a zero trial balance. That is more deductive thinking. That's explicit. Implicit comes from inductive thinking. So now what do you do is you do probability analysis. Lots of probability. The whole idea of Sirius, uh, Alexia, these tools that people now take for granted, they're all based on inductive thinking. The AI and the machine learning that's applied that allows you to have Sirius or Alexa is all based on inductive thinking. And, in, and it really, the, aggress, the mass adoption only happens when they hit about 93% accuracy. And if they go to 94, 95, 96, that they finally get your name correctly, there's greater and greater adoption. Every one of these science breakthroughs you see are being applied as used inductively. So hyper adoption of new technologies and blockchain wallets, which I thought was most interesting, we've had this incredible bear market, the fastest bull and bear I've ever witnessed in my life. Uh, the fortunate parts of this cycle is that cycles that are not debt-induced debt repair themselves faster. Most crises going back 400 years of data that are based on excessive debt take four years to repair. To give you a context, when, when Asia blew up, it was because Japan wanted their money back from Malaysia and Thailand and Indonesia, and they basically took all that short-term borrowing and they put it into buildings. So there's no way they're going to ship back an 80-story skyscraper in Malaysia back to Japan. So they all defaulted on their currencies, and therefore you had a collateral damage of a huge, how do you resolve all this debt? That takes four years. So when did that bottom then? 97 means 2001 was the bottom in Asia. 
That was the first part of the super cycle we had in commodities. Two, would implode at 98. Long-term capital almost imploded and brought down the system because they were leveraged 100 to 1. 100 to 1. That meant a 1% mistake wiped out all their capital. But it was even bigger than that. They had all these other connections and relationships that then magnified that times 10. So that's why the Fed and everyone had to step in because they were talking about over a trillion dollar of collateral damage from long-term capital. But what did it really do in triggering all that sort of global event and the repairing of that was Russia. Russia was having its geopolitical problems. At the same time, it had uh, leverage. If they unwound, they defaulted on the sovereign debt. 98, 98, when did Russia bottom? 2002. So you had during this cycle, between 2001, 2002, you had all of a sudden a mega turn in emerging markets. It's so important when you look at that, and then you had government policies like WTO come in, and you had this growth. So we had corrections, it didn't matter. I found during that super cycle that even when we had commodity corrections, I had positive money flows. When we have a correction today, I have redemptions. I don't have positive money flows. And it's very difficult to, for that money and the cost of marketing and trying to get a new customer is so great to come back into it. So it's a very different cycle. But not so in the crypto world. I'm seeing the opposite. I'm seeing a correction, but I'm seeing the adoption of more people coming in by growth of wallets. I'm seeing fidelity come in. I'm seeing billions of dollars being spent on infrastructure. Uh, I see that uh, uh, J.P. Morgan comes up with their own stable corn, coin. So what's so important for us all to recognize is that these new technologies are in everyday life. And I just absolutely love that time. See the time? See how the hand's moving? The, I mean, all the digital technologies in your wrist? Can everyone see the visual? You're going to be able to have that. That's, that is DARPA investing in the future. And now, how many here do not know of DARPA. So everyone in the room knows about DARPA? How many, how many do not know about DARPA? DARPA is the secret weapon of the U.S. government. It is the smartest Americans, the smartest, who wrap themselves in their flag. They are like Navy SEALs, but it's cerebral. They plan. Silicon Valley was created by DARPA. They have tunnels that go down deep in the ground that no one can tap into the information where they're planning. They have over 100 PhDs that go around and allocate and give money. Google was funded by DARPA. Strones created by DARPA. Highway systems, the planning of it. The internet was all funded and originally started by DARPA. How many here saw the movie Eye in the sky. That was really classic DARPA. All you saw with drones and with bugs, and the idea in the future is that there's going to be locuses that will be able to do facial recognition and shoot the enemy. And so that no human lives will be lost. All of this stuff comes from DARPA. And DARPA does so much in medical research because they don't want their soldiers to be wounded for long and heal quickly. San Antonio is a military city and a huge amount of money and doctors and friends of mine are involved with medical research and the funding that takes place, the future of that. So it's so important to look it up, D-A-R-P-A. -A. You can look at it at Google, Wikipedia, and it's just fascinating to recognize they plan every year 20 years out. What, what they, they think that America needs this 20 years old. And then after they create a GPS, they then turn it over to Google. They turn it over to everyone else. After they create the internet, they let it become open to everyone else. The same thing happens with a lot of the medical research. After being able to heal soldiers faster from burns, etc., then they release it. But this visual on this person's right hand, this is real. And you'll be able to put this in on your wrist over time, not wear it around the outside. It'll tell you all your diagnostics. Do you know that most accidents why people get heart attacks later in life is not just a faulty heart, it's actually low to potassium. The potassium, if your potassium is low, you lose your balance 
you're an old guy, old women, and you lose your balance because your potassium levels are low, and that triggers the heart attack. So they found that most of these accidents underground mining come from dehydration in Africa, in particular these deep mines, it's from dehydration. And they found the same thing with a lot of, of military, that they make bad decisions because they're dehydrated. So how do they monitor and track your potassium levels? So now uh, Anglo-Americans said that some of the machines, they shut down the machines, and that worker has to go and rehydrate before they can drill or drive trucks underground. So this idea of AI and it being applied and machine learning is going to be showing up in your arm, just like you have Alexa. So what is blockchain? When you vote, have you ever wondered whether your ballot is actually counted? If you meet someone online, how do you know they're who they say they are? When you buy coffee that's labeled Fairtrade, what makes you so certain of its origin? To be sure, really sure, about any of those questions, you'd need a system where records could be stored, facts could be verified by anyone, and security is guaranteed. That way, no one could cheat the system by editing records, because everyone using the system would be watching. Systems like this are on the horizon, and the software that powers them is called a blockchain. Blockchains store information across a network of personal computers, making them not just decentralized, but distributed. This means no central company or person owns the system, yet everyone can use it and help run it. This is important because it means it's difficult for any one person to take down the network or corrupt it. The people who run the system use their computer to hold bundles of records submitted by others, known as blocks, in a chronological chain. The blockchain uses a form of math called cryptography to ensure that records can't be counterfeited or changed by anyone else. You've probably heard of the blockchain's first killer app, a form of digital cash called Bitcoin that you can send to anyone, even a complete stranger. Bitcoin is different from credit cards, PayPal, or other ways to send money because there isn't a bank or financial middleman involved. Instead, people from all over the world help move the digital money by validating others' Bitcoin transactions with their personal computers, earning a small fee in the process. Bitcoin uses the blockchain by tracking records of ownership over this digital cash, so only one person can be the owner at a time and the cash can't be spent twice, like counterfeit money in the physical world can. But Bitcoin is just the beginning for blockchains. In the future, blockchains that manage and verify online data could enable us to launch companies that are entirely run by algorithms, making self-driving cars safer, help us protect our online identities, and even track the billions of devices on the Internet of Things. These innovations will change our lives forever, and it's all just beginning. To learn more about the urgent future of the blockchain, please visit iftf.org slash blockchain futures lab. In my journey of learning about uh, blockchain, I was really shocked when I discovered that it was created in 1991. 91, before the internet was out. Who was it created by? Telecom companies. Who are the biggest movers of money in the world? It's not banks, telecom companies. Telecom companies, and if you want to see the evolution without big central banks that we have, is in Africa where they move all their money and zeros and ones on their cell phone. And it's encrypted, and you do debits and credits, and you move money back and forth with each other on your cell phone. The, the, the fact that it was blew me away when I found out it was telecom. Some of the early adopters, in fact, into this idea of Bitcoin and blockchain were telecom people. A lot of uh, Northern Telecom, ex Northern Telecom employees that lived in Dallas, it was a big facility, uh, were early adopters to, to this industry uh, because of the open architecture, but also the encryption that they could move money and protect it. Uh, so a lot of things you just don't realize, you just don't know that someone else reinvented and they said this technology would have great applications after the crash of 2.8 you had, you had basically two people, two groups of people. One was going and protesting all over the, the country to uh, stop Wall Street and blaming Wall Street and the other were the young millennials and the quants that were saying let's have a new system and uh, the concept of, of was capping the number of coins, Bitcoin. Now, what was really fascinating to me was that for the early adoption, 
if you were one of those people out there validating a transaction, you received new coins. That's how the coins were created. And they're called Genesis coins, the first coin. They're virgin coins. They've never been touched by anyone. So the faster you can go in, and every 10 minutes is like a drop puck. It is a scramble to see who can be the person with the fastest technology, with the fastest ASICs chip, to be able to get that, that reward, those new coins for unlocking and reestablishing that pattern, that sort of encryption. And, and so at the beginning, there was lots of coins given out. So therefore, it incentivized when it was like a dollar that there was lots of economics. And as Bitcoin has gone higher and higher, the model was driven that it'll be less and less coins will be rewarded. So as the adoption went out, so did the reward. And that created interesting dynamics of getting people induced early to participate. So 50% of the world's population are using the internet, 0.5% of using blockchain, and 90% of Europeans and US banks are exploring blockchain. And we saw last week, the largest crypto conference in the world is consensus. The other thing that blows me away, even with this massive correction, can you believe if gold fell 90%, 2,000 people would come out to a conference? It wouldn't happen. It just wouldn't happen. If the market halved, the stock market, how many people would come out to an investment conference? Nobody. Not the crypto world. No. It's a complete different audience. It is a complete different group of speculators, and there's too many bad people that are in that whole space that has to get cleansed out. But I could not believe they're still charging $500 to $1,000 to attend, and the conference is sold out. Consensus. Sold out. The lineup to get into consensus had 20 portals of people trying to process you. And it took six hours of processing for people to go into the conference. Uh, and there, these conferences are all over the world. If you don't believe me, go on break time and take a look at Google and just say conferences. The other thing you'll see is ranking writers. Who are the top 100 crypto blockchain writers? Do you see that for who are the top 100 gold stock writers? Who, who writes the most? Who's the best? No, this is, the crypto world is another world. And it has this massive adoption, and they're called nodes around the world, of people adapting to it. Uh, and I remember being in London on a Tuesday night, wet and rainy in January the 7th, and saying, oh, there's a, there's a new blockchain, Peter Thiel's behind it, event taking place in the city. And I went down, it was, it was like being out of Oliver Twist days, and eight at 8 o'clock at night in the basement, there's 80 people talking about a new coin, what they were creating. Do you think we can get 80 people to show up in, in, in a remote area to talk about gold stocks? It ain't happening. Phosphate stocks, it ain't happening. Lithium, it's not happening. It's just, so, so what, why is it happening? The question we have to become curious about, why is it happening? Why are they speculating? The millennials want to trade 24-7. That's, that's a very important part of this whole equation. 24-7. Regulators want to only trade five days a week. When, they, when the markets are when they're there. These are the factors that are, so you're seeing a, coll a, a collage, oh, sorry, what's the word I'm looking for? A, a, a crashing taking place between the concept of where trading's gonna take place. I think over time, um, the Bitcoin audience is gonna win. It didn't work, that one. Don't worry about it. So significant institutions are bracing cryptocurrency. I'll give you an idea last year. Facebook, Google, Yahoo stopped all crypto advertising. JP Morgan went on a huge campaign to trash cryptocurrencies. And this year, the bottom in Bitcoin was the day that JP Morgan announced their own crypto coin. It's called a stable coin because it's backed by US dollars. And they're going to use it for the transaction. So all of a sudden, the narrative no longer is JP Morgan trash talking Bitcoin. Facebook now lets you do advertising. Why? Because they've been working on their own coin. 
and they made the announcement. So I also want to point out that Facebook is probably one of the most advanced science group of scientists in AI, along with Google. I mean, the amount of money, and they had a real scary thing with AI, where all of a sudden they had to pull the plug on it because they started writing their own language. They, that, that the coders, the programmers could not read what they were saying because to protect themselves, they create their own moat and they had to create their own language. So this uh, checks and balances. So when you think of the fact that AI could be that strong and significant, uh, Facebook is there. So JP Morgan creates digital coins. All the other banks are going into it. I can document for you that there was a collusion amongst the G20 countries on being anti-Bitcoin. And that really resonated, as I mentioned yesterday, is that I believe that it's more subtle because it's been longer, but that's what's happened with gold. That there's a pattern that takes place. It has to be very subtle when it comes to gold because you get an uproar against it because it is truly the barometer of poor or good monetary policy. But when it comes to Bitcoin, everyone wants to trash talk it. But there's an adoption taking place. The other thing I learned in this whole thing of AI was meeting a young man uh, that started uh, a company called Machine Zone. How many here know about Machine Zone? In three years, they did six billion in revenue. How many here know Kate Upton? All right, some of the guys know, that's good. Uh, how many know the Super Bowl? So Kate Upton was in the Super Bowl. Schwarzenegger was in the Super Bowl. When they were in the Super Bowl, what company were they portraying? Mobile gaming. So he creates a company, Machine Zone, which processes 500 million instructions per second in 32 languages. Gabe Layton tells me that they need AI, and that's how he's able to use his advertising. It's all done with AI. He doesn't use Facebook. He doesn't use Google because they're too expensive. He has his own way of dealing with it. He does six billion in revenue. He could, and, so, and he also said to me that young men to boys spend more money than movies and music combined with both genders. The total entertainment of movies every year and music is like 25 billion, but these mobile digital games is 35 billion dollars. So esports, all the stuff. Guess what they need? They need our data centers. They need our data centers. If you go to mine Ethereum, we need GPU cards. AI, artificial intelligence, needs GPU cards. They need to have. So this whole presentation this morning is showing you why do how do I go from creating uh, quant fund products, then all of a sudden investing in Hive, and then, then our gold spot. Because I believe that's where the future is going. And I believe it's so important that you have to go up against a wall of negativity because, because JP Morgan's of the world are trying to catch up. They're trying to be part of this whole program. They're using AI for fraud detection, and they're using now AI for capturing customers. I talked with a group that's doing fintech, and the cost for a fintech kind of company out of Montreal using AI is $13 a customer. The, the average is 400 Today, to go and get a shareholder, it can push thousands of dollars. The costs are so expensive to get a new shareholder. In the mutual fund world, it's pushing in the U.S. $4,000. How can they get it at 15? What do they do? What's so special about it? So these are all the questions you have to ask in this new world. Now, you see this big taco here? He is Darth Vader. He is the head of Bank of International Settlements. And do not take him lightly. He's a PhD from the University of Chicago. He's from Mexico. And he's very smart. He basically had Mexico, as a finance minister, hedge their oil in 2009, and the country made $7 billion. Uh, but he is anti, by being the head of the Bank of International Settlements, he is anti anything unless it's paper fiat money. And he's extremely vocal about anything that is digital, or anything that's digital outside of uh, this world. So gold swaps, he's intimately involved with gold swaps. And, then, and spoofing and banks and all the stuff that takes place. And there's more and more information this week. There was a case came out yesterday, uh, two years ago on CNBC, talking about the charges taking place in court examinations discovery of we know from fi fixing LIBOR and we know from fixing certain bonds and securities. We know that's also for gold and silver. 
there's been fines levied. The Europeans levied a $1 billion fine. That's what they were able to find out from uh, cross-examinations. So this is the guy that really was from my epiphany of, me of understanding how the BIS works. So what is a node? And what, another thing that blew me away in looking at Ethereum, the invention out of Toronto, as the second biggest coin, which is called a smart contract, is that it had, it had one time 30,000 coders around the world working free for it. Can you imagine employing 30,000 people, Paul, and have to make that payroll? You know, like, it's a big payroll, isn't it? Can you imagine if you could turn around, Denny, and get 30,000 people working for you free? Ethereum got 30,000 people working free. When someone went, went and hacked a, a, a contract, that the, these Ethereum coders would turn around and build a motor on it, take the money where the broken wallet was, go in and take the remaining money, and then put it into a safe harbor and let people come and identify to get their coins. They became their own police state. No one paid them. It's a very different ecosystem. We don't have that in the stock market. We don't have that in any other place, sort of this passion to protect their vision and dream. So the role of the nodes are very, very important for mining and for sharing of information. And that's why I believe they have these conferences all over the world. And next week is the biggest tech conference now. It's taking place in Toronto. I know that Goldspot and Denny are going to be there, front and center. It is the biggest. And uh, so why? Why did, this, why did um, TED Talks? Uh, how many here have watched TED Talks? Do you, do you know how many TED Talks are watched today? Two million in 180 countries. Every day, two million. Do you know the length of a TED Talk? Is Max know that? 18 minutes. Do you know why? Because they did research uh, with MRIs and AI on where the brain activates and how long can it concentrate. So in fact, I'm not supposed to talk longer than 18 minutes because you will start to lose attention unless I do something freakish. So what have I done? I try to embed a video. And when I embed that video, it actually changes your neurons in your brain that you're not going to get bored of me because I've been talking too long for 18 minutes. So now we're going to talk about Bitcoin. There's 10,000 even after the correction. Ethereum has 10,000 people working free, committed and passionate. I wish we could get 10,000 people working passionate and free for the price of gold around the world. We don't have that. We're not even close to that. And now the other part is understanding the DNA of volatility, which I mentioned uh, yesterday when I was speaking with Marin, is that you have to, to understand capital markets, every asset class has its own DNA of volatility. So you don't become afraid of it. But when you come to Bitcoin and Ethereum, th because they're, they're only five years old, you have to recognize there's much greater volatility. And the same thing, understand, New York always media talk about how negative they're on gold when it has the same DNA of volatility as the S&P 500. So the major events, what we saw last year was uh, three countries at a time would always come up with a negative news. Uh, we saw Bitcoin get sold down because the SEC was going to do an examination. Then all of a sudden it rallied. Then we saw they're going to meet with the Senate. It rallied after the Senate meeting. Then it's tax season. The IRS is going to go after everyone, then pay their taxes. Bitcoin sold down right to the IRS t tax filing day, April the 15th. Then it went through a rally. And you could turn around and watch how it was concerted. It was concert. It was, it was an incredible scene symphony being played by the Bank of International Settlements. So Hive is the first blockchain public company. I tried to launch an ETF in the space and I quickly discovered that the SEC and the OSC was, were not going to allow anything because they're worried about AML, anti-money laundering laws, and KYC, know your client. But what I found out in this journey was <clears throat> mining, I mine virgin coins, I don't have an AML problem. So I put up $5 million, went down the board as a chairman, rather than going to try to keep pushing and spending $1,000 an hour legal bills to try to get a product through, which still no one has gotten a product through, nobody. I created the, the idea, the concept of, of Hive. Now, <clears throat> Fiori had the, I brought, basically brought it to me. Uh, Frank Schuster brought the idea to me with Brian, his sidekick and partner. And, uh, but they didn't grasp what I was grasping from a different point of view. And I, and I was also frustrated because I realized I was not going to be able to create an ETF product. It was just not going to happen. And this, I said, this will work. And I put up $5 million, and in three weeks, it was worth $100 million. 
I never, I never made a hundred million that fast. Never. It always took longer, longer, and much more pain than I ever like. Nothing but pain to make that first hundred million dollars, and I lost it, ninety percent of it, because I can't turn around and be a seller. That's not my ethics to say, hey, everyone by buying a hive and I'm blowing out my paper. That's not me. I believe in the vision of building something. I believe that something's bigger is happening. And it's amazing to see because hive became the darling. Hive became the go-to stock rather than trade on Coinbase or one of the exchanges. It became the way to go play this and the volume shows it. So how do we earn money? We validate these transactions, we get paid new coins, we sell those coins, and, uh, and then we turn around and go deploy into new investments. So Hive's liquidity advantage is many people try to copy us, but I think what people made a big mistake is understanding the marketing. They just didn't understand that the, there was this huge audience, which I did, I was fortunate from gold investors that wanted to buy this, but they didn't trust the ecosystem. They didn't trust the millennials, and that they did trust myself, and they did trust Hive as a proxy to be able to play the space. So like Europe, what took place about the Greek ETF, it becomes its own animal. And that's what's really important to recognize, that when you really build a, a, an asset class now in this derivative world of quants, it can become its own DNA. Uh, John Malden came over to see the operations last year. And the other part is I learned from uh, this whole idea of the quant world, our GPU chips can last a lot longer. Why is that? Because you need it for smart cities and you need it for AI. And our facility in Sweden, which not Sweden, but in Iceland, uh, it can process 100 million instructions per second. If all of a sudden we want to make Toronto into a smart city, they want to put these cameras up all over the city, or Vancouver want to do it, and they need to be able to monitor all this stuff. They've already proven this in New Zealand, uh, that they can track this stuff. So it's all going to be AI, it's all going to be these data centers, and they're going to need these GPU chips. So that led me into gold spot. It was just a, a no-brainer. And uh, we all heard from Denny and how the quant approach to making investments. And that also let me, launched me into going my gold ETF. And the movies, if you, how many here saw the movie uh, Bring the House Down? How, not many. How many saw Moneyball? So both those movies are about quants. And the idea of the MIT professor that really launched quant trading of how you could do card counting and do probability analysis to make better decisions, that led to, the, to basically the thesis of Moneyball. And that led me to create GoAUX. So I did all this back testing. I spent 8,000 hours, and I looked at, at over 100 factors, each one singularly. Then I put combinations, and then I finally figured out that the quant world does not look at book value. They don't give a shit. They don't give a shit about your NAV, discounted rate stuff, that every gold analyst of this day comes in my office and tries to show me why this is a good deal. It will not get flow. They'll buy a vision. They'll buy a growth in reserves per share. If you raise money and you don't find reserves, they sell your stock down. If you raise money to expand production and it doesn't increase the revenue per share, they sell your stock down. If you do a merger and it does not show revenue per share growth, they sell your stock down. They don't give a heck about your total growth. They don't care how many tons you have. They care about how many tons you have per share. Same thing for phosphate. It doesn't matter what the commodity is. And you're, you as a good CEO have to be able to show. And there's a thing called the Prokowski um, ratio. He's a Stanford professor. And he looks at predominantly the income statement. Very little to the balance sheet. Very little to NAVs and book values. And so the more that you write your narrative as a, as a promoter of your story, technically write about it, then you actually you'll get more traction. The GDXJ diluted the value of reserves per share, production per share, by 40% in the past eight years. All those mergers and all those fundings they did did not increase the value factors on a per share basis. And so I create this model and said, I'm only going to own the best of value per share. 
So give me someone that has revenue per share this quarter, which is greater than the past four quarters. That stock outperforms 70% of the time. Give me a stock that the cash flow from the last quarter outperforms for four quarters. It outperforms 80% of the time. Not book value, not cheap NAVs. They don't perform. And that, that analyst cannot actually tell the story because he can't get anyone to buy it. He should wake up to it. They're looking at the income statement. And they're looking at, their, and they're also comparing to value destruction. So that's what I found. I launched the thing, and everyone, you have to wait to prove it, you prove it. And there's my proof of GDXJ. 92% of the time, I will outperform that on a rolling 12 month basis. That's what the math said going back now 15 years. So it works. And it's simple. For anyone in this audience, you're an explorer, you're a developer, you're a producer, look at the value metrics per share. And then what the other part we look at for gravity, we will buy a basket of names that are the cheapest on enterprise value to cash flow. Because the mean reversion for those stocks is the greatest. Enterprise value to cash flow. Cash, free cash flow yield. If you just pick the top 10 stocks with the highest free cash flow yield, even though it's for the last quarter, and that's all you buy, 10 names, you will crush any gold fund manager. Now, I could give you that data. Do you think I can give it to one of my active gold fund managers? Here, make sure this is in your basket. No. They're all addicted to this bullshit of book value to NAV. So there are the names that I have recently. I think my time is up. Uh, and when you create a model like this, uh, it's royalty companies are 30% because they have a superior model. But the biggest owners of royalty companies are not gold fund managers. They don't like them. They think they're competing with them. It's financial institutions. Why do they do that? As another metric, revenue per employee. It's called the efficiency ratio. The more revenue you have per employee automatically gets a bid faster. But you have to put that in your press release. You have to educate the investors because all the quants out there are looking at that data and analyzing it. So when I created Hive, on the back of the envelope, we were going to launch with six million in revenue per employee. Goldman Sachs is one million. Franco Nevada is 21 million. Silver Wheaton, now Wheaton Resources, is $27 million of revenue per employee. That's what banks and financial institutions go to. That, so it's recognizing that if it's in the winter, wear appropriate clothes. They be appropriate. What are they looking for? Where are the fund flows going? So that's over. I'm done. I hope you're totally exhausted. I gave you three cycles of 18 minutes. I hope the video's broke it up the, for your attention span. Uh, but I hope I stimulated you. I hope I inspired you. I hope I motivated you to look at the world differently and don't be intimidated by the quant world. Look how it is a tool. That's what Goldspot, Goldspot is an incredible tool for larger mining companies to use because it can give them a competitive advantage. And also they, their business model is to get royalties on those assets because it can turn around and become a huge win. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, and happy investing and happy learning here. Next. think you understand the junior mining sector and you think that the participants in the mining sector, junior mining sector, are good people and kind people, hit the bid. How violent that term could be, it actually could be quite violent. Uh, it could be a rip your face off uh, uranium rally. And the world is always going to need raw material. It's going to need copper and gold and nickel and so forth. Totally destabilized. Hey, hey, troll, did you hear what's going on in Yemen?